it's going to be what else is there to do in Iceland, especially in the evenings, but to drink. Well, if you were here right now, you could, for example, just step outside and have a look at the Northern Light. I, I just had a announcement, a little message telling me that if the sky is clear, you might be able to see the Aurora Borealis. Apparently, there is some activity, but it's been great, apparently, this season. It's picking up a lot from a couple of years ago when it was almost dead, but uh, doing very well now. Lots of activity, lots of beautiful pictures that have been posted, of course, but the hottest thing in Iceland at the moment is the eruption in Geldingadalir. Thousands and thousands of people have been there and more thousands of pictures and videos online for everybody to enjoy spectacular pictures. And of course, you can see it live as well. So if you've got absolutely nothing to do except drink, you can always watch Gelding at Alert. <laughs> but um, I've got some pictures to show you and uh, to tell you about some of the things that I think are interesting in Reykjavik in particular to do whenever you make it over here and I'll be happy to take you there myself as soon as you get here. So let's start off with a picture of Reykjavik. And here we go. It's not opening up, is it? Supposed to be a fine picture of Reykjavik over here. Here we go. Reykjavik, of course, is a beautiful little city. Most people agree. It doesn't have that big city feel, but at the same time, almost everything that you will find in a big city is available in Reykjavik. And uh, you'd be surprised how many events take place any given evening, any given day. You just know, have to know where to look and uh, be quite aggressive to find these things. Ask around, because some of these things that happen almost impromptu, music events and uh, shows that uh, seem to appear out of nowhere. There's a little venue, for example, called Vinyl, that is actually run partly by Björk, the musician. You never know what's going to happen there. They try to give you a program. It's a very small venue though, and uh, it's mostly experimental music that is put on. People that she likes or, or apply for it, step up and uh, give you a good show. This is in downtown Reykjavik. The place is called Vino. If you're into electronic pop or avant-garde music, this would be the place to go in and uh, look out for. But it is quite difficult at times to keep track of, of what's going to happen there. Getting around in Reykjavik is relatively easy. There's always the buses. They run all over Reykjavik. 
doesn't matter how far you have to go within Reykjavik, you pay the same price. And even during the COVID pandemic, people are still using buses and apparently horses as well. I don't know how this came about, but uh, I picked this picture out from an article. This is how it usually looks like. They're yellow. And uh, wherever you see the hash sign, that's where they stop. Their timetables are posted in, the, in those places. They're also the same company that run tours around Iceland, in fact. Those buses are half blue and half yellow. Strange looking, but uh, it is uh, basically a Reykjavik city service that uh, runs these tours all around Iceland. You can hop off, hop on and take a tour by these what we call them Strato, and the S stands for Strato, which means just a city bus. And uh, very punctual usually, and uh, usually the drivers are extremely helpful. So no problem getting around the city and even further with these people. Then there's always the good old taxi, Seems like a jolly fella there waving to you. There are several taxi companies, but uh, if you are make your way downtown, you're in a restaurant or something, there are always dozens of them at least waiting for customers. And uh, they are also quite uh, pliable and uh, nice people. They never take you for a ride anyway, unnecessarily, or try to uh, swindle you in any way. Perfectly trustworthy. And uh, many of the companies are now running free shuttles from different, from downtown, if they're a bit out of the way. This one is from the Pearl. And uh, if you make, if you're downtown, they have a stop outside the popular house that you have in the background there, the Harp, Harpa, the most recent addition to the Reykjavik skyline, the music hall that we are very happy with and quite proud of. Maybe a little bit more about Harpa later. This is mainly to tell you that the, these shuttles are marked. Some of the hotels are also offering free rides to and fro or from the hotels down to, to the downtown area where the most of the bus seems to be. Oh, beautiful hard by there. See how they can light up the glass building and put any colors in any shape almost. And this is the rainbow, obviously, that they are trying to emulate there of Harpa. Harpa is such a wonderful place. And usually there is a show on every night in one of their halls. Some of these shows are in English. Of course, if it is a musical, it doesn't need to be in any specific language. But of course, most of the popular music is sung in English. There are some shows there that are meant for visitors, how to become an Icelander in, in 60 minutes is one of the shows, very funny. And that's usually on. And then you just have to look out for the what's on the offer at the time of your stay. But apart from the shows that they're offering, the building is a, a beautiful building to look at. And it's worth stopping just for the architecture. 
at the harp. Again, the harp. Close to the harp is a place which nobody wants to miss out on. Even presidents and heads of states, when they visit Iceland, will go to this place to have a taste of what has almost become their national dish for many people. It became incredibly famous when pictures were taken of President Clinton when he stopped by to have an Icelandic hot dog at this very place. Of course, you can get SS hot dogs, which is the supplier of the hot dogs uh, all over Iceland. But these people have some kind of a knack with their, their hot dogs. And uh, people stand in rows almost all day in order to get hot dog in this particular place, even though that on both sides there are places and little shops, kiosks like this one, where they can get hot dogs as well. So what makes them so popular? Well, apart from uh, Clinton having eaten one, it is that uh, they are quite tasty, both in, uh, during the day and during the night. They are also quite cheap. One will actually make for a lunch with a drink. And uh, most people find it worth it to stand there in the line to get uh, a taste of it. But they are actually made of, 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 um, of lamb meat. And uh, there are two different types of uh, onion that goes with them, both the uh, raw onion, which is uh, cut very uh, chopped up into quite fine and small pieces. And then there are fried onions and they're fried, fried dry crisp. They're put on. Then you can a choice between the different sauces that you put on. Most people put on remoulade, they put on ketchup, and they put on mustard. That is the traditional Icelandic way. And it's, at this place, they put it up in, 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 into the bread in such a way that the taste becomes absolutely unique. So you can just turn to them and, and do like the Buddhist says with the hot dog vendor. Just make me one with everything. And they will know what you mean. One thing that is uh, quite unique in, in Iceland, especially in Reykjavik, is the type of a graffiti but uh, they like to do it. It's more like art. And I'm quite a big fan of, of some of this, uh, these pictures. But, uh, and the ability of the artists, traditional sort of markings of, of, of graffitists, there are them too. But more of those fine pictures so if you walk around Reykjavik downtown or wherever, you will come up on these artwork on houses, which I think is quite fun. And I collect pictures of uh, sort of local artists, although they are not known, that uh, show you what they can do almost everywhere. So local art is all around you. Of course, this house has great pieces of art from 
different times and different artists. This is the Reykjavik Art Museum, not to be confused with the National Art Museum. This is also in Reykjavik. They are responsible for several different galleries in Reykjavik. They do um, Ausmunder Jonsson here to the right and his uh, artwork. And they are also responsible for Karval Stalin. And they are also responsible for probably the most famous artwork in Iceland. That is the peace column that was created by Yoko Ono in memory of her husband, which is basically a column of light that is lit up the day he was assassinated. And uh, they cut it out on his birthday, or was it vice versa? Ausmunder has a, which is under the auspicious of the Reykjavik Art Gallery. It's a beautiful house. This is his studio. He's a 20th century man. And his style in many ways, almost cupid. But uh, he finds inspiration from the Icelandic history and the legends. Many of the pieces are displayed in the garden around the house. And uh, if you're not, if you don't want to go in, it's not necessary in order to encounter and, and see his art. This is displayed there, like I said, around the, his studio. This is Karvalstadir, the other major studio, well, exhibition hall that the Reykjavik Art Museum is responsible for. And it is named after what Icelanders consider their greatest painter, Johannes Karval. It is on to his work, not all of it, because it's all over Iceland. And it is probably the most expensive paintings that you will find if, if anybody wants to sell, that you can find for, uh, from an Icelandic artist. Karval was an eccentric man. And he would stay out in nature. Didn't matter what he was really painting. He always went out into the lava fields, onto the beautiful spots, and just started painting. He used to go to booksellers, secondhand booksellers, almost every day and see something if something had come in that uh, would inspire him. And one of those antique booksellers told me a story that he came in one day and uh, was feeling quite depressed almost because he hadn't had any ideas for a long time. And he asked the bookseller, has anything come in, anything interesting? And uh, the bookseller said, well, nothing. Except I, I had some, some comics, some Donald Duck comics. And Carol said, well, I'll have those then. Maybe I can make something of it. But he was quite open to ideas from everywhere. But uh, his artwork is totally amazing. And if you get the chance to visit the Reykjavik, if you want to visit one art museum, that should be Karval Stader, I think. So here's a little uh, video, I think. <laughs> uh, 
And uh, there is uh, this new adventure that they're offering in Iceland. It's called, called Fly Over Iceland. Pictures are worth more than anything. And uh, so I'm going to see if I can play that video for you. Uh, it's just not it gives you an idea of what, what uh, they're offering. It's amazing experience. Everybody that uh, it's not very, it doesn't take a long time. But uh, everybody that goes seems to be extremely happy uh, with their experience. And uh, they have kind of simulate you flying to Iceland and with effects. Okay. This is not going to happen. Yes, people definitely claim that uh, it is just like they are in a shuttle flying and at extreme speed into volcanoes. And it isn't very expensive at all. Something that uh, you should just try out, uh, if you, especially if you are not going to be able to afford flying in real time over Iceland. And this is even better because they, this is done by professional people. The pictures are better. I have flown around Iceland many times and was hardly able to see anything throughout the, through those windows. And I was absolutely blown away by, by this, uh, this production. It is downtown. Well, in the Harper area, easy to find. And it doesn't take up much of your time. Several shows a day, of course. Easy to find out. Around Reykjavik, in all directions, even to the west, where there is nothing but the Atlantic Ocean, but west of Reykjavik, on the tip of the Reykjavik Peninsula, because it's located on a small peninsula, there's this place. It's called Grotta. Grotta has a lighthouse, operational, and it has uh, an art center, which has become an art center now, managed by a committee. People can apply to stay in this house, and there is a community, small community hall there as well, and to work on their projects. It's a brilliant place. It's not big, but uh, absolutely brilliant, right down by the seaside. And you have a brilliant view over the ocean and sometimes over to Snipelsnes and you can see the Snipelsnes uh, glacier, Snipels Jökull, yeah. on a good day. It has beaches. Actually, there's a very uh, narrow causeway leading up to the, it's like almost like an island where the, where the lighthouse is situated. And you have to be there at the right time because on high tide, you can't get over there. It's also during the, during a certain time of the year, it's a soft limits to go over to the island when the bird life, bird are hatching their eggs. And they try to protect them from the traffic by restricting access to the island at certain, certain months of the year. But this place is also extremely popular during the winter time because as soon as you are in this area, you are not really disturbed by the city lights. And people who don't want to drive far and know that the Aurora Borealis is going to be around like tonight, they will just drive out there five, 10 minutes drive from wherever you are in the city and you're in a very nice place to see the Northern Lights. Or you can go there on your birthday like I do and have a little dance. I usually try to find the beach on my birthday 
to to a little sorpa dance and uh, a year ago i was here in iceland so this was an absolute yeah excellent place to do so but like i said reykjavik is surrounded by nature in so accessible within minutes i'm now talking and showing you the mountain of asia which is the mountain you have in view wherever you are in reykjavik this mountain that dominates the landscape around Reykjavik. And uh, people go there, some people go there daily, every day, to walk up and down the mountain or run it because the paths are uh, well marked. And unless the weather is really bad, it is accessible. It's a beautiful, uh, slow, well, for me as well. Anyway, it is a slow walk up the mountain. Most of the time I don't make it all, all the way up, but uh, if you do, you have a grand view over the whole of Reykjavik and the Southwest area, really. Just make sure that you are not caught by the trolls. The trolls, they usually hide underneath the small bridges, as you all know, being familiar with Icelandic lore, full of trolls. Yet another area close to Reykjavik, the Red Hills. I've talked about the Red Hills before in details, that they are made up of pseudocrates that I like to speak about because they are unique to Iceland. And this area is very scenic, very beautiful, and easily accessible. You can even walk there if you uh, don't mind spending an hour or two walking. But within five minutes, right out of Reykjavik. And beyond the Rauholar, we have we have uh, the wooded area of uh, of Hedmark, of course. Hedmark is just beyond uh, Rauðhólar. It's a wooded area. It have uh, different types of trees there. And it is a favorite habitat of the rabbits that have now starting to spread around Iceland. You're almost certain to see some rabbits scooting around if you go to Helmark. A beautiful place. And especially if you want to take a picnic with you, there are facilities around there. It's like a park almost in that sense. So Guide of Iceland uh, provided me with this picture of uh, the best known landmark. I've also spoken about Hallgrimskirkja and uh, hardly anybody comes to Reykjavik without visiting Hallgrimskirkja. You can see it from everywhere within the city and a lot of information about it available almost everywhere you go. But as you come out of the church, in the house right here on the corner, I'm pointing towards it now, there is a restaurant called the Lucky. Lucky, as you probably know, was the trickster, the maker and the shaker in the Norse mythology. Nothing exciting ever happened to the gods without Loki actually being involved or even provoking events. And therefore, this is a fitting name for this restaurant because it serves things that can may upset you. 
traditional Icelandic food. And uh, this is way beyond the hot dogs. This is what Icelanders ate in the past. And everything to them was food. And they had to use everything. There is uh, the only way to storage things for a long time in the past was to sour it. We didn't have much salt, so we didn't salt much of our meat and fish. But we soured everything. And the fish had to be dried, wind dried. So hard fish or dried fish would be on the offering. The dark bread, which is made up of rye and brown molasses, molasses, sugar, boiled often in the hot springs for 24 hours and it is delicious with a bit of uh, butter. These are, uh, these are blood puddings. And uh, these ones are, if you had a bit of, uh, of wheat of some kind, you would mix it in with the fat from the sheep. All this is, these are sheep, but it didn't really produce anything from chicken or beef or any other animals. It was mostly just mutton. But what gets most people is this part here, these little pieces that stuck with the Icelandic flag on it. This is the fermented shark. This is a fancy word for a putrated shark, a rotting, rotting shark. Icelanders, most of them don't like it, but older people of generations that are, were brought up on this, they, they still think this is the best thing they ever got. We also have there in the, in the back some herring, some pickled herring, and that one is still very popular. Now you walk down the street from this church and all the way downtown and you come to the Icelandic flea market or the Reykjavik flea market. This is called Kolaporti or the coal, the coal port or the coal gate. But most of the vendors there are permanent sellers. And this is where you go if you're a collector or just about anything. Records, books, clothes, secondhand clothes, and some new stuff. It is open on weekends, Saturdays, and it's a very interesting place to visit, even if you're not going to buy anything, just to see even the Icelandic traditional food is on sale there. And uh, you always see something that catches your eye and you would like to have. Cola Porte. Also, if you are just moving house or like I am at the moment, and you, you wanna get rid of something, this is the place to take it, a flea market. And they have books, many, many books. Icelanders still reading books. I was asked uh, not too long ago by a young man, what do Icelanders do actually? during the winter time, when you don't have any light. The days are so short, what do you do? I didn't know whether he was serious, 
but I answered the well, we stay at home and we read books and we play chess. And uh, all the work is done by house elves or the hidden people. So that's how it is. Not sure what the, why I put this picture in. Oh, right, yes. This is actually the Forgotten Museum. You see, this is a hotel. And when they were building the hotel, when they were starting to build it, they came up on ruins that nobody knew was there. Not really. And rather than just shoving them away or building on the top of them, they made them a part of the exhibition of the hotel. So you go down underneath the hotel into the cellar, and there you come up on ruins that actually date before 874, which is the magic day when Iceland is supposed to have been settled. These ruins in Reykjavik date decades, if not a century before that. And they call this the settlement museum. It also shows very clearly how Iceland very early on became deforested. And uh, how Reykjavik and that Reykjavik area actually looked, they've been able to map it out so that you can see it, how it looked 1150 years ago. A must place to go to if you want to go to a museum because it's very, very well done. Definitely urge you to do it. Settlement Museum. Close by, actually just across the street, is a place that I like to visit all the time. If I have people with me that uh, don't have the time to go around the country, I go into the, to the basement of this place to take them around Iceland. This is actually the city hall. And uh, in the basement, they have this fabulous topographical map of Iceland, a huge one. You can walk around it with uh, several people and uh, talk about all of Iceland right there. And if you don't have anybody to guide you, it's still worth going basically to orient yourself in Iceland, get the sense of distances, the white patches, how are the glaciers, and uh, you see that they cover so much of the highland, 20, 30% of the highland, it's incredible. So definitely an interesting place to visit, just for that reason, apart from the architecture. A lot of people disagreed with their placing this house right there, built into the natural pond that we have. But most people have not to agree that uh, it actually is quite all right. Looks like a huge bunker there, but uh, it's very distinctive. You can see that there is uh, ice on the pond, but uh, right up close to the building, the water is free of ice. And this is why uh, the reason is that they pump hot water into the pond in order to keep a part of it free of ice so that the birds don't have to leave or will have a place to stay. A lot of people like to go down to the pond and buy bread or, or something even more healthy, healthier than bread to feed the geese and the swans and the other birds that uh, stay there the whole year around now. Just a 15 minutes walk from downtown in the university area is also a place that is worth visiting. And that is the National Museum. 
we don't unfortunately have many items from the past, but enough though. Nothing really from, well, we have some, but not much from the Viking Gates. We don't have a Viking boat, for example, which would be nice, like they have in Norway and other places. But um, the people that uh, run the National Museum, they have made, done a fantastic job of, of telling their story in with, with the items that we have, telling the story, the history of Iceland. And the price in there is very reasonable. They have got a nice little cafeteria there or coffee house. And if you are tired of uh, looking at interesting things, you can always sit down and have a cup of coffee. That helps a lot and goes a long way. Definitely recommend the National Museum as well. If you are not interested in reality and history and so on, you can go and see this guy. He is obviously a lot into uh, gnomes, you would call them gnomes, but he runs what we call the Elf School in Iceland. It only goes on for a day. You pay a little money and this guy will teach you everything that he knows about elves. I don't know why he loves the gnomes there with the hats that were quite popular amongst miners in Germany at one time and were therefore incorporated into the images of dwarves in the story of, of Snow White, for example. Uh, Walt Disney, he used this, they, them, this motif. But uh, he, will, he will tell you what he knows about elves. And uh, a lot of people find it interesting and he is an interesting character actually. I think that he is himself more interested than, interesting than the stuff that he's teaching. So if you get him to talk about himself and his experiences, that is worth the money. The elf school. can't really go to the land of the Vikings without getting a picture of you in the, in the gear that they used to wear. And there's a place in Reykjavik called Mink, where you can do just that. Extremely authentic. So if you don't have to, uh, don't have to change your appearance and, you know, or put on makeup or beards or anything, just put on these dresses that they make. Oops, I didn't. And uh, you look like a Viking. I look like a unicorn there, don't I? This is how you're supposed to look. Truly authentic medieval, medieval dresses. Place called Mink and Reykjavik, downtown Reykjavik. Everything seems to be downtown Reykjavik. But uh, that's good for you because then you don't have to go far and you can visit most of these places on foot. This is a very well kept secret. This is where Reykjavik people go to the beach. And uh, the Atlantic Ocean is generally far too cold to swim in. So are the lakes, most of the lakes in Iceland. They're just too cold if you could, could stay, if you haven't trained and you stay in the water for too long, you will start to suffer or even die from hypothermia. But uh, the Reykjavik city, they have made a kind of an artificial beach there, brought in the white sand, made a little cove of it, 
and then they pump hot water into the ocean as, as the Reykjavik city is heated up with geothermal heat. Hot water flows into every house and it is, has, a, has to have an end somewhere and then it ends up right there. Hot water comes out into the sea from the having gone through the city. Still quite warm and then heats up this part of the cold enough to, for people to swim. But of course they have a like a huge hot tub there, hot pot like we call them, where people like to just stay. And to enjoy the warmth. Even during the winter. This place is, uh, well, it is just beyond Tartla, so out by the sea. Between, it's between Peratla and uh, the old Reykjavik airport. Quite easy to find though. So, you spend the day looking at museums and uh, Tasting Icelandic food, visiting art galleries. Then you might want to come here. This is Kathy Rosenberg. Rosenberg has been around in different locations for, for a long time. And they always have interesting musicians and artists presenting and then performing in the coffee house. In the evening, of course, this turns into a restaurant and a bar. And uh, brilliant atmosphere run by marvelous people. That you should, uh, well, they just have a knack for creating the atmosphere that is necessary to enjoy the art that they put on. I love this place. And I've liked them wherever they have been. This is actually the third location that I've been to. But uh, during COVID, of course, there wasn't much going on. COVID free, this should be the place to go to, to enjoy an afternoon and an evening, if you care to see live music, live presentation. Rosenberg. And again, very much downtown. So there was a fella in the north that thought that people around the world visiting Iceland would like to see uh, genitals of anybody. And he put up the phallic museum. Apparently, he wasn't all, all that successful in the north, so he moved it to Reykjavik. And uh, there he operates, formidable man, with all these dicks around him. And uh, he has made a success of it here. Then there is the Saga Museum. It's a wax museum, actually. I think they are mostly made out of wax. Maybe wrong though. Anyway, this is a, a museum that creates scenes, famous scenes from the Icelandic silence. Usually somebody killing somebody. But they are well done. And people love, love it because it looks quite realistic. And uh, that museum used to be in the Pearl, but has now moved to a, a location which is actually close to yet another museum, which is the, which is the Aurora Borealis Museum. We actually have a mu museum 
presenting the aurora borealis. But uh, the pearl has now uh, got to very interesting things to see at the pearl. You have an uh, have an ice cape and sort of a, looks very natural. Of course, it is artificial, but they have uh, made an ice tunnel that uh, feels like you're going into the glacier. We have the museum, a natural museum there, birds and creatures of Iceland. Not many, unfortunately, we don't have that many. We only have six species of wild animals in Iceland, and they're all there on display. Also, creatures that are hard for us to see, but live around us nevertheless, critters that live in the lakes. And then they have uh, the most fabulous Aurora Borealis presentation. They literally project it all around you. It's very real. It's not the real thing, of course, and nothing compares to the real thing, I must warn you. But if, there are lots of people that come to Iceland wanting to see the Aurora Borealis, and they strike out. They don't have much time, maybe three days or three nights, and they strike out. And if I was to supplement the uh, or compensate them in any way, I would take them to the Pearl and uh, Northern Light Show. But uh, this is uh, yet another thing you can do around Iceland. Just uh, off the coast of, uh, of Reykjavik, there's this little island called Mede. And uh, it is quite interesting to, uh, to explore it. The person that is often regarded the founder of Reykjavik, built his house there. And uh, there's a ferry that you take over to the island, short ride, very short ride, five, 10 minutes. And uh, you go around the island and uh, explore the howl of Skuli. And then you come back. Just a little thing to do if you don't want to spend the whole day traveling out of Reykjavik, going whale watching or doing the golden circle or whatever. This is still quite within reach. Of course, going to a, the Blue Lagoon, has been all the rage for so long. It is uh, most, uh, the most popular man-made attraction in Iceland, I would say. But I bet you if uh, Comet wasn't hampering us, getting a dollar eruption would probably uh, be the winner today. But, this is a, a regular swimming pool in Reykjavik. Each area of Reykjavik has its own swimming pool. This one is in Arbair, which is in the suburb of Reykjavik almost. And as you can see, it is, it's not a, a regular swimming pool, it's a, it's a water garden. And uh, so much fun going there. If you want to meet up with Iceland, there's have a real talk with them, then you should go to one of the Icelandic swimming pools. They show up in the pots, they sit in the hot pots and they solve the problems of the world right there. So getting to know Icelanders is, is this the place to go. And if you have kids with you, they are very, very kids friendly, shallow pools, and of course with abundance of geothermal hot water, they can do this. And the admission price is just a fraction of what you would pay, for example, if uh, going to the Blue Lagoon, just a fraction. I think it costs less than a, uh, $10. $10. It's probably about $8, I think, right now. Admission price to these pools. They open early in the morning, close late in the evening. Beautiful place to visit.
But once you have done all this and you want to uh, go and have a beer or something else, this is the place to go to. This is a, a real Icelandic drinking hall. It's called Ölstorn, the ale room. And uh, it's probably on the average the longest, uh, has the longest opening hours. If it isn't full uh, and you can get in, they will uh, allow you in after, after one o'clock on regular days. And of course, cover tree era. It is run by these two guys and uh, their wives. And uh, they are frequently seen there. And the bar, you can catch them there every other day or so. And uh, they've done a, a marvelous job of keeping uh, keeping the bar the same, has all kinds of Icelandic sort of home art on the wall. And therefore, quite uh, attractive for visitors to come and see how the Icelanders, how the Icelanders uh, behave when they are drunk. No, they are not all that drunk. Who would get drunk in a bar? So approaching the hour, and there are lots of time. And uh, since uh, all the bars are closed at the moment in Iceland, well, most of them, you, they can only, only 10 people can come into one and it's not worth it for them to keep open. You wouldn't be going there, but you may be going out to, to see if something else is going on. And there's always something else going on in Reykjavik. Right now, the, if, the, if you can see stars, you should be able to see the Aurora Borealis. So that's my little special tour of special places that I like in Reykjavik. It's very hard to keep secrets in Reykjavik. Very few really secret, secret places. But I think I came up on a couple of them there, at least. The last one, Ulster one being one, because you don't really see many foreigners, many visitors, many tourists coming to Ulster one, and it's worth it if you if you can find it, the ale room. So that's it for now. Uh, I'm haven't gotten uh, to see the eruption yet, but uh, everybody else seem to have and there's so much material on it i doubt that the, i can do something that you haven't seen before but if i make it up there i will definitely uh, make you privy to it whatever i may whatever the experience is going to be and if i don't do it over the weekend it's just coming in and uh, I'm definitely going to watch it to Kepler week over the weekend. But uh, if everything goes according to plan, I will be seeing you next Wednesday night as well. So thank you for coming along and being with me. And uh, good evening, good night wherever you are. Bye-bye.